see a building, a bridge, uh, a car, a movie, they're probably being built with software that was designed here at Autodesk. We're going to get a look at not ju just uh, how they build this stuff or how they design this stuff or how they build the tools that design this stuff, but we're going to get into what they know about the world, and it's pretty cool. Who are you? So I'm Brian Matthews. Uh, I'm a group CTO here at Autodesk, and I am a maker. I'm a, uh, a nerd, a, a designer. Um, I'm a licensed ham radio operator, extra class. Uh, so anything technological, I'm, I'm into it. You're like a walking TED talk, is what I... <laughs> I uh, love TED. It's one of my uh, favorite things, so absolutely. Well, thanks for giving me a tour around. What is the space that we're in? This uh, right now we're in the Autodesk Gallery. Uh, it's open to the public once a week on Wednesdays from uh, noon to five, uh, with a tour at twelve thirty, uh, and it's really celebrating the process of design. Uh, what our customers do uh, with technological tools to design the world around us. You know whether that's a bridge or a car or an airplane uh, or the cell phone that's in your pocket. How does design happen? Uh, where do ideas come from, and how do you develop them into the real world that we live in? Yeah, I've interviewed uh, you know uh, architects and people who build things. Um, you know, the guy who built the Seattle Mariners Stadium, for instance. And I, my old idea of what Autodesk was, was, oh, you guys build the, the software that sort of builds the frame and understands the metal property. And getting a tour here is like, no, that's like 1% yeah. of what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So can you give us a, a little look into what Autodesk is now? Uh, most Probably people don't know what Autodesk does. You know? Yeah, if you think of the company's history, we're about 30 years old, and in the beginning it was really about documenting your ideas. You had an idea in your head and designers needed a way to communicate that to the people who are going to build things. So that's AutoCAD and that's what people remember of us. But if you look at what we are 30 years later, we're into many things in the design space. Everything from conceptual design to simulation, how do we make more green buildings, uh, you know, sustainable design. Uh, everything from uh, movie industry and how the special effects are done, uh, pretty much anything that's got 3D graphics in it, we've probably had some part in that process or some tool of ours is being used in that process by our customers. Our customers really design the world around us. Yeah. You're uh, one of the CTOs here. Uh, explain what you do here as part of your day job. So I look at the technology in our architecture, engineering, and construction space. Uh, the, the technology products that we make are for solving problems in that area. Okay. And what I, what I loved about what you guys, what you're showing me is, uh, I'm writing this book about context, which means uh, my internet world is going to know something about me, you know, i.e. what music I listen to or uh, what I click like on on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where I am, you know, w the fact that, that I'm here on uh, uh, Google Maps, right? My phone knows I'm here. And soon the system needs to know about the world, more about the world and the people I'm next to, right? And you guys are studying ma materials and how they interact and how they deform and even how you can grow new ones using some really mind, well, yeah, tell me what you're what you're Yeah, you're seeing. talking about what we call the convergence. So yeah. we have software and our customers who work, like you said, with materials. So in the movie industry, how do you make wood uh, look real or a plant look real in Avatar? And then, you know, that's rendering. Um, if you think of our manufacturing customers who are building products like uh, an elevator, an escalator, that product or a chair that you're sitting on, that has to go into a building. And there's architects that use another uh, part of our software suite to design the buildings that are going to have those lights and doors and, and chairs that are manufactured. The building is going to sit on a piece of land with the infrastructure. So how does the water main come in and the, and the telecommunication lines and the power come in? And then the earth itself, how do you deal with rainwater and, and uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, sewage treatment and, and downpours and things like that? How does all of that uh, infrastructure and roadway design, how does the whole system to come together? So then you start looking at city scale design, not just these models of buildings, but models of entire cities. So think of kind of Google Earth, instead of being a static, you know, rendering of something, think of it as being a live database. Uh, and that data is being fed by a sensor network of an entire city scale. And what would this sensor network tell me in, in real time? What, you know, if I was the mayor of New York, what, what, what am I going to be able to see in the future? Because well, if of you're in New, New York right after Sandy, it's a lot of things you'd want to know. I mean, certainly in a 
yeah. normal city at normal time, you'd be interested in traffic patterns. You know, where should we put in, uh, uh, replace a, a traffic light or reprogram it? Where should we put in a new roadway? Uh, how do we keep a lot of idling cars, you know, from burning fossil fuel? You know, those are some simple questions. You've got people, friends of the ur urban forest, who have to worry about sudden oak death syndrome and how they're going to deal with that over time in a city. So, you know, cities need to plan things at, at a large scale. Um, utilities as well. I mean, everyone likes to see the movies. No one really thinks, everyone talks about that kind of stuff. But how many people actually think about how the water got to their house today and how important that is? And then, you know, with Sandy, uh, that, that kind of a storm can wreak havoc on the power system, the utilities, the water, the, all of those systems. And so having a sensor-rich network that can help you divert or figure out where you need to send a truck and be more responsive uh, and do planning, planning for the future is, is really powerful for our customers. So you have a couple sensors behind us. One yeah. is, uh, well, this octocopter, you fly, uh, what, cameras and things mm -hmm. over cities and buildings and you can do what with that? Yeah, we're doing some research with that. Um, we have uh, kind of traditional technology for capturing existing conditions. Uh, the one in the back there is a Faro laser scanner uh, and it captures a 3D point cloud. So it's kind of like what a digital camera does but in 3D uh, and at long range. Um, but there's some places it's hard to get that thing into and so we can do, we have technology to use just normal photographs. If you take any object, uh, your, your foot, and take pictures of it from different angles, you can make a 3D model of it and make a custom shoe. Uh, but we can do the same thing for buildings and, as a matter of fact, for sustainability, we're very interested in figuring out how to get a digital model of the existing buildings. Because if you're going to renovate your home, should you buy solar panels, buy new windows, put in more insulation in the house, you know, what's the best bang for the buck? Really, the only way to figure that out is with a good digital model of your building, and it, it can be really hard to capture. You know, most people don't have a $30,000 laser scanner, um, though that's really useful. Uh, we can approximate that with just uh, digital photography. The, the camera that's on your cell phone can give us that model, let us run a simulation, and a contractor. You, you did that to my face, right? You yeah. just took, a, I don't know, 20 or 30 photos of my face walking around, and it turned that face into a 3D model, right? Yep. And we think that that's got big implications with 3D printers. If you think of the music industry, what MP3 files did when you could digitize the music and the whole ecosystem around it, we think the same thing happens with Atom. So if you can capture reality in 3D using uh, pictures, um, you know, you could take any product. If your you know, coffee mug uh, isn't the right shape for your hand or doesn't hold enough coffee, take a picture of something that's existing, bring it in the software, modify it, make your own playlist, if you will, and, with the music analogy, and then use a 3D printer to custom print uh, a product that's uh, individualized. It's just for you. When we were looking at the 3D printing technology that it currently exists, you, want, you said um, complexity is free. And yeah. I thought that was mind-blowing. What, what's behind that? What do you mean by that? Well, if you think of a uh, 2D printer, you, you all know it doesn't matter if it's my, you know, my young son uh, writing a, a book report or if you've got a Pulitzer Prize winning article that you print on that 2D printer. The printer doesn't care. The cost per page is the same. The complexity of what you're writing is free. And a 3D printer is the same way. Whether you're printing a car uh, and there are people doing that, or printing an organ out of stem cells, people are working on that, or printing food, or there's people printing drugs, or various types of plastics. Um, the shape of the object, the printer just doesn't care about. Uh, and that's very different from traditional manufacturing where you have molds. You know, if you've got your Nike shoes and they've come out of a mold, uh, you got, that mold may have cost you know, tens of thousands of dollars, and you, bought a, you better you know, make a lot of those shoes to recoup the costs, to get it, even to start to get some profit out of that thing. So when you've got a 3D printer and you can print one of something, that's really exciting. And, and it really means that the software is kind of central to that whole process. You know, instead of rip, mix, burn, we call it rip, mod, and fab. Mod for modeling and fab for fabrication. We're just at the beginning of this age. I mean, I, I think Bloomingdale's just got a, a, a sensor kiosk where you stand in it and measures your body for different kinds of clothing sizes mm -hmm. using, uh, I think, four Xbox Connect sensors. So mm -hmm. low grade, $100 sensors, pretty sure. easy to build that. We're just co going into an age where everything about us is going to be computerized and put in the system. What does that let a company like Autodesk do? Well, we th you know, it's really what our customers do with it. Yeah. We're the tool maker, but the thing that we're excited about is really where the cloud goes with all this stuff. So as you put sensors into every building, every bridge, you know, we can make these chips that are you know, 10 cents. They're essentially free. You sprinkle them into concrete, into your your wood fibers, everything um, can be smart and send these digital packets. 
uh, sending information. And you've got you know, your Google Glasses, your, your uh, photography. So all this data, we think, is going to end up in the cloud. Um, and it's really about analytics. You know, you know what the social graph is with Facebook. We talk about the design graph. How do we take all of these designs that have come out of CAD software and hook them up to these sensor networks that relate to those designs and let us understand how the world uh, can be made better, how it's operating, how we can make it more efficient. So how do we run our office buildings more efficiently? You know, there's always that air conditioner that was left on over the weekend, but there's no way to visualize the problem. And so if you can't see the problem, if you don't measure the problem, you can't solve the problem. Yeah. And we think that's just one example, but that uh, putting data in the cloud and having city scale simulations uh, of real time data is, is pretty exciting. You also, if you just measure this room, you know that that window is hotter than over in this corner. Sure. And so now you know where to put a little air conditioning duct or a, a little fan or something to help that guy out and, right, and make a building more efficient. Yeah, and we want to go to the next step, which isn't just the data, but it's the computation and simulation that goes with that data. So we've been investing a lot in all sorts of different types of mathematical simulations. So how do we like fluid? You, you yep. showed me one 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 simulation of wind going through New York uh, skyscrapers or or mm -hmm. Shanghai skyscrapers, right? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, that's computational fluid dynamics. If you want to make a car more aerodynamic, and by the way, Irby has had 3D printed cars. So in the future, imagine printing an own custom car, but you want it to be aerodynamic. Well, you need that. Uh, fluid dynamics of, of airflow of, over the surface to be right. Um, so we think all these things are, are becoming more accessible to the public, uh, easier to use, and we can take a lot of that complexity and the expense of simulation, move that to the cloud. You can effectively rent a supercomputer for you know, pennies uh, and do some pretty impressive things in the future. So one of the exhibits here is with Nike, right? And they're mm -hmm. building new kinds of 3D printed shoes, basically. You know, yeah, I mean, they're 3D woven. It's called the Flyknit. Uh, yeah. Really exciting technology. No two shoes need to be exactly the same. They, and, the, and again, the complexity is free. The machine doesn't care that it's not making exactly the same size. It can really individualize that. So if you start pulling these different technologies together of taking photographs, making a model, taking a, a, a model and, and, and making it right for the way you have an instep, let's say, and custom printing some shoes or custom weaving these shoes, uh, that's pretty exciting stuff. Well, not only that, but uh, the internet's going to follow me around as I live my life. So it knows how many hours a, a month I go shopping, how many hours a month I go hiking, how many hours a month I go... Yeah, Nike uh, Plus, where you got the sensor right in the shoe. That can become a feedback loop for how you, in a future version of that, you could imagine having more sensors about where the pressure points are in the shoe and how you're performing, and then your next pair, because you've got effectively 3D printing, no two, the complexity's free, you've got simulation, we can run a simulation to figure out how to modify the shoe to optimize it, and your next pair of shoes are better than your previous pair. Well, I, I expect that someday I'm going to go into Macy's and they're going to just print three shoots, right? A oh, running absolutely. pair, a shopping pair, and a, yeah. a work pair, right? There's a store in New York that's a 3D printed <laughs> store. Everything they sell is, is printed in the store. So that's already starting to happen. Well, you guys are able to build materials out of bacteria and what's going on there? Yeah, that's another one of our <laughs> customers using our tools. Uh, okay. Yeah, David Benjamin um, at The Living. Uh, He's done some research with different types of bacteria that can, uh, they make different materials. Some are like a rubber, some are uh, calcium, kind of a brick-like substance. And by using computer simulation, you can run evolution uh, digitally. So instead of working with real bacteria, you can speed up evolution in the cloud um, using this design simulation software and figure out what nutrients to feed to these different colonies of bacteria to get a desired new metamaterial, a material yeah. that isn't like anything we could manufacture through a traditional process. You think of the way uh, the human body has cartilage that's kind of hard on one side and soft on the other, and it's a continuous gradient. You know, it's really hard to make something like that in an injection mold. You know, it's all the same plastic. Yep. Um, but through these metamaterials and through 3D printing and bacteria, or we call it uh, bio nano, um, where we're literally doing design of uh, nano uh, structures, so DNA uh, as an instruction set for a bacteria, or DNA by itself, where the DNA is like two by fours in a building, where you can make structures and little robots uh, out of that. We're getting a taste of just how advanced you guys are here. Where do you come up with knowing the new ideas? Do you go to TED conferences, or uh, how? What are, what's going on in the labs right now that you're coming up with where the future of Autodesk is going? 
Uh, we certainly go to TED conferences. We're a sponsor there. We've been a sponsor for many years. So yeah. often we take uh, a lot of this gallery, we take it to TED and uh, show some of this stuff off. Um, you know, we're a big company. We've been around for 30 years doing all sorts of design. I think probably the most um, rich source of innovation is the invention that's already happened years ago, but it's happened in another industry that you don't know about. Take multi-touch. Um, there were some people, some researchers at our company that were working with multi-touch displays in the 1980s. And long before the iPhone and before the revolution that we have today in this stuff. So that was an invention that happened many years ago, but it wasn't really discovered by you know, the, the consumer electronics industry until much later. But other researchers in the human you know, interface design space knew about that stuff. So in our company, we're lucky that we don't just serve one industry. M most big companies you know, focus on manufacturing or geospatial or architecture. And we're different in that we service the media and entertainment, so special effects for movies and games. We do architecture and we do manufacturing. And so you start to see innovations that happen in one field. And I talk to my colleagues and we, we apply it somewhere else. So your customers co probably come in with a problem and say, hey, you know, Steven Spielberg comes to you and go, I want to make a new kind of movie, and I, here's what I'm thinking. Is that so, part of the innovation culture here? Absolutely. Um, you know, that happened with James Cameron on the movie Avatar. Uh, he had some requirements. You know, we had some ideas from a completely different market manufacturing, and we could bring that into the movie industry. And sometimes it goes the other way around. Uh, some of the uh, rendering techniques that were developed for, for uh, video games are now being used in design of bridgeways. Yeah. What's blowing your mind lately? Because you're uh, in a pretty mind-blowing place. <laughs> I think the bio-nano simulation field is pretty mind-blowing. I mean, to, to, if you think of a cell, bacteria is really just a factory. And that factory is, if you think of it, is robots running a program. DNA is a program. As we start to look at DNA as a programming language, it turns out there are things that are analogous to subroutines and loops and if-then statements, things we already understand. So how do we build the source code control system for bio code? How do we build the compilers? And how do we run the subroutines? And how do we write code at the biological level? Uh, not to do genetically engineered food and all that, which you can do, but we can use this to have you know, bacteria make biofuels that can make biosubstances and materials. And you know, the advantage, while there's, there's certainly some things that we need to be concerned about in that space, but the advantage is um, compared to traditional manufacturing. You know, we paint things with toxic chemicals. We make shapes by heat, beat, and treat, and burning lots of fossil fuels, and, and making things that don't break down naturally when they hit a landfill. If we can do make our cars and our substances and our products um, using a biomimetic uh, approach, um, you know, it's more sustainable, it's less toxic, um, it uses the sun for its energy, it, it, the benefits could be huge. And so we're literally using some of the design simulation we did for the manufacturing and video game industry, and we're applying that technology at the nanoscale now. That is pretty much the most mind-blowing stuff I see. Um, you keep mentioning cloud computing. What's the infrastructure that you're seeing, and, and how are you guys innovating there? Yeah, I think, you know, to date, the cloud has been about better, cheaper, and faster ways of doing stuff we already understand. And I, the thing I'm excited about is kind of the next generation. We call it infinite computing here, which instead of you know multiple people hitting one Twitter server, um, you know how do we have multiple servers serving one customer? You know this concept of rent a supercomputer. Yeah. And if you think of you know the movie Avatar, one frame of animation took 72 hours to compute um, those beautiful uh, pictures. Um, if you have you know, 50,000 servers, you can do that same amount of work in, in a second. Yep. Uh, and you don't need to own it in the cloud. You, know, you can go to a rack space and, and rent this equipment. So we see you know, today what's being done by professionals uh, renting these big cloud infrastructures. We see that coming down to the consumer and marrying with that these design tools and simulation tools. Really, you're going to allow um, normal consumers to imagine you know, design and create their ideas before they're ever real. Simulate them in the computer, optimize them, and build them once. Much unlike today's manufacturing, where you build something, ship it from another country, burn lots of fossil fuels, and it ends up on the sale rack because you built the wrong thing. Yeah. And I love that, that saying that you said earlier, complexity is free, because cloud computing lets you try like 100,000 experiments 
all at one time because you can rent more and more uh, compute. You don't have to wait for that thing to be shipped and try it out. Can you unpack a little bit about what you're, where you're thinking of that, that, that ability to try many, many things all at one time? Yeah, that's an angle of, uh, of that infinite computing concept, but combined with genetic algorithms, what we call algorithmic design, um, or you know, virtual evolution. Um, you literally, I and mean, we have over here a, an example where um, David uh, uh, at, at The Living is having buildings have sex with each other, in effect, where um, if you think of the parameters of a building, how much insulation it has, whether it has solar panels, its orientation relative to the sun, those are genes, and you can take two of them and they can exchange genes. You can throw in mutations from a product catalog, substitute a Pella window with an Anderson window, and then run a simulation on some offspring of combinations of these building genes. And some of the buildings are going to perform better in an energy analysis, some will perform better in an earthquake analysis, some will be cheaper or more expensive. And you take all of those simulations and find out which are the best performing buildings and let them procreate, let them evolve through many generations of this. And the way you do that, you know, that normally on, your, on a desktop workstation would take more than your lifetime. But in the cloud, you can rent a supercomputer for a couple hours, you can run thousands of simulations evolve a building to a final optimized shelf. And it's, it's really a lever arm for human imagination, human creativity. You get an idea, you get a constraint system, you, you give it to the software, and you let it look much deeper into the problem. You also showed some, uh, like the New Bay Bridge to me, and you showed how the customer who built that bridge is simulating how to build that bridge before they build it, how, you know, how to make the logistics work. Yeah, that's, uh, we call that a 5D model, so it's three dimensions, the digital model of the bridge plus time and cost, and so the time is, is a big one. If you think of a bridge um, like the Bay Bridge, a million people go over it a week, you can't close it while you... Uh, try and build a new one. So they have sections of that bridge they literally have to build in three days. And to get something as complicated as a bridge done that fast, they simulate everything in software. It's, you know, it's kind of like virtual reality for bridges. Um, and you know where you're going to put your hammer, where you're going to park your car, put the materials. And everyone's got a job to do, they practice it, and then they go to the real job site, and literally they finish off in a couple hours early. Very cool. What, anything else you'd like to tell me about what's going on here? Well, tons of stuff. You know, reality capture is a, certainly something that's close to my heart. Um, this ability to capture the world through sensor networks is a, is a big one. Um, you guys are covering that. Um, you know, I'm certainly always looking at, uh, at the next uh, special effects movie. I go to look at the, at the leaves out in the forest of Avatar instead of necessarily watching the movie. But absolutely. Well, thank you so much for a really great tour and uh, giving me a taste of what, what Autodesk is doing lately. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye.